You got your Bible tonight. Say amen. Amen. Boy, I tell you what, I've got uh, some people that have sent me some really good stuff in the last couple days since I did Pastor Mike online yesterday. Uh, and I dealt with um, what people in America had a struggle with. If you were to ask you know, the typical American man, the typical American adult woman, 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, do you believe in ghosts, haunted houses, things like that? Most of them would say no. That's all fairy tales. That's a myth. There are no, real, there are no witches. There's nothing like that. Well, that's changed. That's changed dramatically. And it has a lot to do with the influx of, of certain occult related TV shows, innocent ones like, you know, the Adams Family and Bewitched and I Dream of Genie. You know what jinns are in the, in the Arab world, the genies? They're not these beautiful blonde Barbara Eden things that you would just love for her to fall in love with you and get married. They are evil beings. They're devils. And um, so basically, America was conned into believing that they were these benevolent creatures that could do just about anything they wanted to because they had s secret magic powers or whatever. And then it's gotten worse. I mean, it's just a cult everywhere. It's in advertisements. It's in TV shows. It's in movies. And especially it's in kids shows, kids cartoons and watch out for that stuff. Because I'm telling you, it was a draw to me to want to look and delve into witchcraft when I was, when I was in elementary school, grade five, grade six. I was wanting a book on witchcraft so I could learn how to cast spells and do these things. And here I am going to church here as a boy, sitting in Sunday school, listening to sermons. But I, I want, that had it appeal to me. Don't let your kids, if you let them watch it, sit there with them and explain to them. Now, let me show you in the Bible where that is wrong. And um, train, that's part of training. I don't think it's a good idea. And I never, uh, my wife changed me on this. I was going to be very strict when we first got married with our kids, not let any, not let them watch a whole lot of television not let them watch certain shows, not let them watch this, not let them watch that, or be a part of this or part of that. And, um, I, I, you know, I was going to be pretty strict about it. But my wife said, you know, they need to know what's in the world. They're going to find out sooner or later. And how does the body build up an immunity to certain things? By being with it. There are guys who handle snakes for a living and the snake venom literally has almost no effect on them whatsoever because they've been bitten so many times, their body has an immune, has, has built up a blockade against what that venom can do. And they can get bit and it might hurt, it might swell up, but they're going to be fine. And it's the same way when it comes to our children, I believe that you should train them, which means that, yes, let them know that there are things out in this world and then train them to stay away from those things. Amen? Uh, because it's at some point, once they're out of your sight, somebody's going to, the devil's going to send somebody to them and introduce it to them. Guaranteed. That's what he does. All right, John chapter 10, uh, and we'll read uh, part of this. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Then I've got some prayer requests here um, that are highlighted, and we're going to get to those at the end of the service. John chapter 10, verse 19. There was a division, therefore, among again among the Jews for these sayings. Remember a house divided against itself cannot stand. You had two major factions of the religious ideas of the Jews. And by the way, it's still pretty much that way. 
You have Jews in name only. And even some of those don't believe in God. You have Jews that may go to temple on the Sabbath, uh, but you would not call them Orthodox Jews. If you go to a certain neighborhood in New York City and you want to see the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jews with the big hats and the curls coming down their head and all of that stuff, you want to see that? You'll see it if you go to a certain neighborhood in New York City. And uh, I was fascinated by that because I didn't know that they had that community there. But they, they God bless them, they fought for their rights in all this pandemic stuff against the mayor or the, or the governor of New York State. They fought and stood for their rights and they in some ways were persecuted for what they, for what they were doing. They were going, we're not taking that junk. We're not going to get that shot. We're not going to do all that. But anyway, there's still a division among them. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe the miracles in the Bible were real. They believed that they had some sort of logical explanation for it. The Pharisees, they believed the law and the, and the testaments and the prophets um, to some extent. They believed um, in a resurrection. They believed in the miracles. But they did not like Jesus and they made it known very early on in his ministry. Why? Because he was able to do miracles and he was drawing disciples away from the religious crowd in Jerusalem. If these people already have a religion, why don't we just leave them alone? Because their religion will not carry them through the gates of pearl. Somebody say amen. So there was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Now they didn't. I don't think they actually knew that Jesus had a devil. But they certainly wanted that out there. They wanted to scare everybody into believing in Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus is not, in fact, the Son of God, and you see this in Scripture where several men stood up, I think one of them was um, Joseph of Arimathea, who stood up for Jesus and said, do you remember here a few years ago we had this zealot and some guys thought he was the Messiah and he had a following and they tried to revolt and, you know, all of the, 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 the leader got killed and so all the disciples scattered and you don't see them around anymore. We don't have that problem anymore. And then you remember this guy. So there had been a series of messiahs that showed up to the Jewish people. And here's, I think it's Joseph of Arimathea who says, if Jesus is not the Son of God, why don't we just leave him alone? Because at some point, if he don't produce the goods, his disciples are going to leave him. They're going to abandon him. They won't have anything to do with him. But if he is the Son of God, like he says he is, which one of us has the power to withstand God? So, verse... So they accuse him of having a devil. Verse 21, others said, these are not the words of him that hath the, hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Let's pray. Uh, you pray for me. Uh, pray for the work that we have to do at home, the work and the ministry that we have here. Pray for Michael. He should be coming back next week. Next Wednesday, I believe, and we're looking forward to having him back. And um, I've got some other names on here. We'll get to that later. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you, and I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for what he, how he withstood the religious, holier-than-thou crowd. Father, I never did like people that, like that without realizing that I myself was like that. Better than other people. A better Christian 
than my Bible college schoolmates. And Father, you had a way of humbling me and helping me to not think so highly of myself, but to submit ourselves to you and to call upon you for our help, for our comfort, for guidance in our life. I pray, Heavenly Father, tonight you would bless and open your word to each and every heart. Those that are here, those that are watching online, be with my wife this evening. I pray, God, that you would give her comfort, give her healing. And Father, bless uh, Brother Roy, uh, his blood pressure. I pray, Lord, that you would give him healing as well. And Lord, get him back on his feet. We love him. We pray, dear God, that you would uh, bring your people in to the house of the Lord. And just let them know that salvation is a free gift. And you give it to them freely. I pray, dear God, that you would use this church to help spread and preach the gospel in every sermon and in every place we go. Father, that's what we're asking you to do. So, Lord, bless and guide us in our study of your word tonight. Uh, Father, clear my mind and help me to focus just upon the word tonight. Blessed, I pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. I, was, I, don't, I don't do this very often, but I was reading the comments from... Uh, Pastor Mike online, I think it was, I don't think, I can't remember if it was yesterday's or the Watchman broadcast that I did Sunday just to see what people were saying about it. And one lady wrote in the comments on YouTube, uh, she said, Pastor Mike, I'm so thankful. I was saved because of your ministry. Now, here's the thing. Um, it's not that I'm against it. I just, you could probably count on both hands the number of times I've just directly preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and how a man can be saved but what God has helped me to do is to give people massive doses of the Word of God and once that seed is sown in their life it's like an unstoppable force people will just They'll be drawn now to the Bible. They'll be drawn to the Word of God, and they will yield themselves over to God. And uh, I could ask for no greater thing than for someone to say, Pastor, you, you convinced me that I was lost, I needed to be saved, and I went out and bought a brand new King James Bible. Amen to that. So anyway, now, verse 24 uh, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Remember the sheep know their master's voice, and there are other People as sheep who are listening to the wrong master, listening to the wrong one. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. What's sad about the world that we live in today is that because the devil has done such a good job at removing the sound of God's voice in this book and the words that can bring men to salvation and perfection, because, because the devil has done such a good job of getting people to cast aside the true word of God, most people don't know what our religion is about to begin with. They believe those who ridicule us, eh, them preachers are all alike, they got their hand out, it's not to shake your hand, it's to get in your wallet. That's what they think about all preachers. All oh, those people down there, I know some of those people, they're a bunch of hypocrites. I'll never go to a church like that. In fact, I don't, that's why I don't go to church. Oh, I believe in God, and I pray to Him. And me and God got our own deal working here. That's an excuse where you get to go out and sin all you want to, and God's going to overlook it just because you're you. But anyway, um, same with the Jews. 
How long dost thou make us to doubt? But most people don't know the gospel. They don't know what it means to be saved. They don't, I never forget standing in line at Walmart at the pharmacy. Somebody's, uh, two people ahead of us were talking about uh, Easter and, and the day happened to be a Friday, so it was Good Friday. And they, there was a younger man standing in front of me and he said, what is Good Friday anyway? I said, well, it's a commemoration of the day that Christ died. Now, he probably didn't die on Friday because the numbers don't work out. But it's a commemoration of the day that Christ died to ha and all the sins of the world, including mine and including yours, were cast upon Jesus Christ and he took those sins away from us by way of the cross. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved from all of your sins. Well, that was pretty much all he wanted to know. I pro he didn't want to know any more. He, he didn't want a sermon, especially from a guy like me, so he, he didn't listen very much. But anyway, they don't know anything about the gospel. So he says in verse 26, But you believe not because you're not my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. I already read that. Now watch this. And I give unto them, verse 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's, if you've heard that verse before, underline that. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What does that mean? That no man, neither, uh, neither shall any man Pluck them out of my hand. What does that mean? Well, we used to sing a song uh, on the church bus and, and at camp and in Sunday school. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world. We used to sing that song. But how is it that God is holding us in his hand? Anybody want to try this one? Come on, you get a free DVD. Can't beat that one. What is it? How does that work? How is it that we are in God's hand? There's a picture of it. Huh? Well, yes, we are. Okay? And when you are saved... There's something that God, or let's say an angel, will do. He will take your name, and where will he put it, Melissa? In the book. Amen. So, turn to Revelation 5. I didn't, I didn't have this in my notes last Wednesday night, and I went, was going back over it again today, and I thought, you know, I, I've never really thought about that before, but I, that's what I think. No man shall pluck them out of my Father's hand, okay? And, I, and I, as I read this, I want you to understand where I'm going with this. Revelation 5, verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Now, the Bible also says that we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit, that phrase is mentioned exactly seven times in the King James Bible. So, just like the book is sealed, we also are sealed unto the day of our redemption, to wit the, um, or the day of our adoption, to wit the redemption of our body. So, um... In the book that God has in his right hand, and there's multiple things that the Bible tells you that it represents, but one of them is God's membership list. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Does the bank that you go to have your name written down? If you're an account holder there, do they have your name, address, phone number, social security number, driver's license number, copy of your signature? Do they have that on file somewhere? 
Yes. Now, if you don't bank at a certain bank, do they have your name written in the books? No. It's because you don't go to certain banks. And I don't know why one person picks one bank over another. They're banks. Okay? But anyway, if, if you go there, they have your name. Now, to, in today's world, it's done electronically, but the idea is still the same. You are part of their, orga their banking organization. Therefore, by a contract that you signed with that bank, you have rights to your money. Uh, remember in 2008, when Obama became president and the housing market was taking a dive, well, people started getting scared. And Lisa had money in a savings account at our bank. Now, I won't tell you how much, but it was more than eight bucks, I'll tell you that. And she got nervous, and I did too, and we went to our bank one day and said, we want to withdraw all of that money out of our savings account into cash. And, of course, that bothered them because they use our money and invest it while they're holding it to make more money. That's what, that's what banks do. So that bothered them. And they were trying to soothe us and say, look, we're on stable ground. We're, we're not part of this. We don't, you know, that nothing's going to happen to us. They would say that. You would expect them to say that. But that's what we did. And we had to wait a few days because they had the, had the money brought in. But sure as the world, we took that out. Most of it, not all of it, but most of it, a significant part of our savings account, we took that out in cash and stashed that away somewhere. Now, it's not still there. But that's what we did. We have a right to that money. They cannot refuse us that money so with that membership comes benefits. Amen. And now, because of the, the, the depression, when all the banks failed, you had people running to the banks to try to get to the bank to pull their money out, and the, all the bank doors were locked, and, and the bank said, we don't have your money. Well, wait a minute. I put it in here. Yeah, but we don't have it. In other words, they lost it all in the stock market. And so the government, I guess, came up with the idea of federal insurance for all savings and loan companies. Your savings account, your checking account is insured, let's say up to $100,000 or whatever. It's insured so that if that bank fails, you will still get your money guaranteed. See, there's benefits coming when your name is written on their register, isn't it? Okay? Nowadays, I mean, when you go sign and check in at a hotel, do you have to give them your name? Yes. And when you get a hotel room, you're signing a contract with them that you're going to spend such and such nights. They're going to rent you a room. You're going to spend certain, certain nights and you get certain benefits out of that. And they can't just, because they don't like you, kick you out whenever they want to. You, they have an obligation to provide you a decent room, provide you cleaning services, and some biscuits and gravy the next morning. Amen. But that's the benefit of it. And in this book, in God's right hand, sealed with seven seals, is your name if you are born again. So verse 2, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And it, look at that verse 3, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So think of it like this, okay? God is holding a roll of a book in his right hand. It would be like his scepter. And somehow, some way, your name is written down in that book. When did God write that book? 2,000 years ago? 
3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago? When did God write his word? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It was in eternity past, and it will be in eternity future. It's the same book. So God actually wrote your name down in his book before you were ever born. Because he knew you were going to be saved. Now watch this. According to Revelation 5, who, who is it that can take this book out of the Father's right hand? Nobody except Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Pluck, no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. Because God's got it, and there isn't a man there, and, and I want you to understand this. 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in this world have entrusted the mother Catholic Church with their eternal soul. And let me tell you about that mother church. She is a mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I watched a guy uh, the other day. He was a former CIA guy. I don't know what all he did, but he was talking about the Vatican. And, and if you remember Pope Benedict, his personal secretary was copying documents that were being sent to uh, the Pope, and most of them dealt with all these pedophile priests that were around the world. And Pope Benedict chose to ignore it. Well, his personal secretary made copies of a lot of those letters and released them and ended up writing a book about it. He got arrested for that. And what it exposed was a network of priest cover-ups. Another book that has come out, it was written by an Italian homosexual who said as many as one-fifth of all of the priests in the Vatican City are sodomites and pedophiles. At least one-fifth. That's 20% of them right there. And these are the people that 1.2 billion people have entrusted their souls and their salvation with. And if the Catholic Church says, you can't go to heaven because you didn't eat this and you didn't do what we told you to do, you can't go to heaven. They're saying, we're the ones who write your name in the book of life. Not God. Amen! So, verse 3, or verse 4, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, it, it will be known. See these people right here? They're mine. And they've always been mine. And no man was ever able to pluck them out of God's hand. It's called the book of life for a reason. In Psalm 69, uh, this is, I, if I remember right, it's about Judas Iscariot. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. So I, let's say this is the book of life. As I'm going through here, and I'm reading, I'm going, hmm. I don't see Adolf Hitler on this list anywhere. I don't see um, Charles Manson. I don't see um, 
Barack Obama written on here anywhere. I definitely don't see Joe Biden on here. I don't see those names written on this list. And if their name is not written by God in his book of life, you cannot go to heaven. You can't go. You don't have a right to go. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, some people live in a gated community. And nowadays, those, they keep those gates closed. There's a lake um, place down by where we live, Rain Tree Plantation. And all of that is a gated community that is around this big lake there, not too far from our house. Now, I can't get in there. You know why? My name is not on their list of people who have a right to be on that land. So they have a gate and it's got a code on it. And I'm sure they change the code every so often. But the bottom line is, do I have a right to go into that property? No, I don't. And I used to, I tried playing golf there once back when they would let you in. But they don't let you in no more. Okay, so that's the benefit of having your name. When people say, well, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. I'm just as good as any church person. Yeah. But is your name written here? Or has it been blotted out of the book of the living because God would not let you stand with the righteous in the day of judgment? Exodus 32. Look at Moses. Moses is a foreshadow of Christ. Because Moses is, in this case, willing to yield his own life so that Israel might live and not be punished for their sins. So what does Moses do? He offers himself to God. God, if you're going to do anything, kill me. Look at what he says. It, it, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for you for your sin. That's Christ. It's a prophecy of Christ. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now, I don't know about y'all. I love my wife. I love my family, my grandchildren. I love this church, your family. I love the online people. I try to do everything that I possibly can for them. But if you were to ask me, Mike, would you voluntarily go to hell for eternity for somebody that you love? I would say, I know. But I'm not Christ. This is why only Christ could do that. Moses made the offer. God did not accept it. He said, Moses, it, it doesn't work that way. If they committed the sin and won't repent, I will blot their name out so that it's not in the book of the living. Out of my book is what he said. Psalm, uh, Psalm 139, 16. Thy eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. We use this to talk about DNA, but think of it as a book of membership. And in, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now, we have certain requirements if you want to be a, an official, legal, and it is legal, voting member of Bethel Church, Festus, Missouri. You have to 
live within a certain distance because if you absent yourself, if you attend here and want to become a member and you become a men member, but something happens, you backslide or you didn't like something I said or some, you thought somebody looked mean at you or whatever and you just said, I'm not going. After six months, according to our bylaws, we have every right and the responsibility to remove your name off the list because you have chosen not to return. And let me tell you why that is. I, I haven't told this story in a long time, but when, when my, our good friend, Pastor John Uter, he was pastoring a, a church there just not too far from where he lived there in Lebanon, Missouri. And John's a good man. He is a good man. Loves people. Preaches good. He's got some insights that, boy, I just, uh, he sees things that I don't see. And I just love the passion that he has for winning souls and preaching love to people. Um, but he started sticking with this King James. And at the time, the former pastor, Melissa, of that church decided to remain in that church as a member. Not only was he a member, he was on the board of trustees. And John said some things about the Bible. He said some things that were from the Bible and he preached the Bible. And they decided they were going to have a meeting and have a vote of confidence on him to vote him out. Well, they had the meeting. And the, the vote did not go their way. The confidence vote went to Pastor John Uter. And he said, now, it seems to me that if you have the right to call a vote of confidence on me and have me put out, I now can call for a vote of confidence on you as members who are the ringleaders of this. And they all, it was three families, and they all stood up and said, there's not even any need for this. We're out right now. We resign our membership. And they walked out the door. I'm not done yet. Because John delivers mail to all those people. He has a, he's a rural mail carrier. And he delivers mail to all those people. And he sees a, a guy the next day that was part of that group. And John's just going to be friendly to him. He's not... But the guy said, you know, this is not over. John said, what do you mean? They said, we're going to come back next Sunday and call for another vote. And John said, you can't. You gave up your membership. And the guy just made this up out of his head. He said, it's not official because it wasn't voted on. So here's what they did. They got on the phone to every family member that had ever gone to that church for the past 40 years. John's teaching Sunday school on that Sunday morning and all these cars are pulling in the parking lot. And between Sunday school and church, and we know this because one, one person actually admitted they had talked about a plan. They called the sheriff of the county to meet them there. And what they were going to, what one man was going to do was try to get up to John and get in his face so that John would push him back and he would be arrested and taken out in handcuffs for assault. They admitted that. Now, John said... There was, Mike, there was people coming in that church that I have never seen in my life, much less ever saw in that church. But they claimed that they were members and they had their membership here. There's a reason why we purge the membership role every so often. Okay? Now, if somebody wants to come back, and that's fine. We'll we put them back on. Okay? But they had it, in their, and when... when they came in, and John realized what it was. He said, there's no need for any of this. I'm walking out, and I'm leaving, and you can have this church. 
he goes home and all of a sudden about 15 cars pull in his driveway of the people that said, John, you're our pastor. They started a new church. But I told him, I said, John, where's your bylaws? He said, what's that? I said, John, David Gibbs, a Christian Law Association, says you need a document that states what you do, what you're there for, and how you do it. And because it could not be proven whether or not these people were actually members or not, John could have challenged it in a court of law, or at least he could have challenged it in a district tribunal. That was done here at Bethel when I, in 1979, I believe, when I was about 12, 13 years old because they were going to try to throw the pastor out and there was going to be, and so the executive committee from the St. Louis District of Free Will Baptist Churches came in and they had a court session. It was to be handled privately, not in the world. But they would have had a lawsuit saying it is illegal for these people to show up because they've never been here. Okay, so what I'm getting at is this. There's benefits if your name is actually on the list. Amen? There are benefits if your name's on the list. Now, your name being on our church membership list does not make you more saved or make you saved. It just means that you can, you have a say in this church and its ministries. Okay? It, not everything, not, it doesn't mean everything's got to go your way. It just means that you have a voice to share whatever you think the Lord's laying on your heart. So thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written. Which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So before, before Genesis 1-1, God already had this book. With the names of everybody who was going to live in heaven before they were ever born. That's what that means, which in continuance and fashion, when as yet there was none of them. They got their name in the book. They haven't even, the first man has not even been made yet. But God knows that eventually the people on this list are going to come around to his saving knowledge and, they're, and they are going to be born again. Revelation 3. How do you get your name on God's list? He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. What is white raiment? It is the righteousness of the saints, which is the righteousness of Christ. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Shh. When I was in school, Michaela, Jaden, your grandpa used to be in school too, okay? And when it came time for PE class, and we were going to play some sport game in PE, they had everybody line up, they would pick a couple of captains, and these guys would pick their team members, and there was about three of us guys that is almost like we were in a contest of who was going to get picked last this time. Because usually, I got picked last. Okay? Doesn't matter. I still get picked. Okay? And I'm going to give it 100% if I'm out there. He that overcometh. I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So one of the things that I liked really well in high school was gym hockey. And we would take the basketball court, make a hockey rink out of it, just our tennis shoes, and I always played the goalie. And I would bring my, I brought a, a baseball glove, and I had a mask, goalie mask on. I mean, I did it. Okay? And I had a glove on this hand holding my stick. Very rarely did anybody score on me. 
So the guys then figured out, if we need a good goalie, Hoggard's the guy. So when my name gets called out, the first five people that get picked, I'm going, yes, that sounds good. Okay? Find out what you're good at. Amen? I was a good goalie. Um, I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names, he's talking about the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. One of the benefits that you get by having your name written in God's book of life is that God will not turn you over to the mark of the beast. Listen, you internet gazers. You have been so duped and put in fear that everything that comes out now is going to give you the mark of the beast without your knowledge. No! I'm here to tell you that if your name is written in God's book of life, He will not turn you over to that. You need to read some more of your Bible. And quit being scared to death about everything that comes along. But that's the mark of the beast. I'm not getting that. Who remembers when barcodes first came out? On products. What was that, late 70s, early 80s? And everybody said, that's the mark of the beast. I'm not buying that. I ain't buying that junk. That's the mark of the beast. Right there. Well, that, fade, that little thing kind of went away after a while. Nobody thinks that anymore. But I'm just telling you. If your name is written in God's book... He's, he's not going to turn you over to that. Revelation 20. In fact, I want you to turn there. And, and then, yeah, we're going to close with this. Revelation 20. This is, this is known as the great white throne judgment. I'm in John 20, and I'm seeing Mary Magdalene going to the, she's going to the tomb. Revelation 20, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. What are those books? What are those books? Those books are the books where your sins are written. All you have to do is go to court one day over a traffic ticket and you'll see it because I got a ticket years ago and I tried to pay it and they said no with this as fast as you were going you have to go stand before the judge and I did not want to do that but I realized why when I'm sitting there watching how the court works there's a judge just small town judge Hillsboro and there is a, a lady prosecutor, and she's got a manila folder with all the accused names on it. And she pulls out a folder. That's a book. And she calls for the name on there, and they come and stand before the judge. And the judge says, what is she charged with? Your Honor, this person is charged with Section D, Penal Code, la-di-da, that they did this. Okay, and the judge says, how do you plead? See, that book that the prosecutor, the accuser, has is the book of your deeds that you did wrong. There's a list of your sins, including all the thoughts that you committed. Okay? So, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things. See, that's where I get that from. Out of those things which were written in the books according to their what? And see, some people look at that and say, obviously that's a different gospel because they're being judged on their works for salvation and not grace. No, 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 no. That's not what it means. If you are not saved by grace, you will be judged on your works. But if you're saved by grace, God won't judge you on your works. He'll judge you on your faith. Now in verse 
15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And how long does that last, J.R.? Forever and ever and ever. I don't want to go to hell. I cannot tell you how bad I don't want to go to hell. Um, it's time to pray. It's time that we really start thinking about people that we know that are going to hell and pray for them.